So this uh, current magazine of New Internationalists, the November, December edition, is focused on land rights. I don't know if you can quite see it. Um, and as part of this, we touched on how evictions and violence, often of indigenous communities, have long been used to establish and expand protected areas around the world. Um, and today we're able to go deeper into the ideas that fuel this and also what we can do about it. Um, it's vital that we take seriously the threats to biodiversity, the environment, as well as the need to combat climate change. Um, and we can't deny that human activity in so many places has had a negative impact on the planet. But research has shown that indigenous communities are the best protectors of their land um, and fortress conservation is not the answer. Um, and this event will be just over one hour long. Um, it's not a lot of time for such an extensive topic, but if you have any questions throughout, please put them in the Q&A box and we will try and answer them within the time. Uh, and my colleague Hasna Ara is helping out today and will be in the chat um, uh, kind of helping out with anything that needs doing. So we're really lucky to have three wonderful speakers with us who are really passionate about this topic. Uh, Pranab Doli is a politician and indigenous rights, uh, an indigenous activist who belongs to the Mycin community in India. Um, Fiore uh, Longo is a campaigner at Survival International. And we also have uh, Yannick uh, Nodinho, um, who is Managing Director of Traditional Ecosystems, Survival Tanzania, and a Maasai leader. And they can talk more about themselves and their work um, in just a minute. So I'd like to start by handing over to each of our speakers to introduce themselves um, and tell us a little bit more about their work. Um, uh, Pranab, uh, would you like to go first? Thanks, Amy. And uh, I mean, uh, definitely with a very limited amount of time and uh, also to discuss such a topic, like, uh, which is very vast and uh, intense, uh, is a difficult subject, but uh, we will definitely try our best to at least give a glimpse of like what is happening uh, in the name of conservation in areas like where I come from, which is Kaziranga, and it's uh, it's in Assam, which is the northeastern part of India. So personally, I live in the vicinity of the forest, and uh, and I work as an I'm engaged as a politician, and uh, have been a vocal advocate for the rights of the people, and uh, against displacement, against militarized conservation. And uh, it's a con continuous process, and it's also an activity which is uh, uh, which is uh, a day-to-day -day affair here. And uh, I guess, yeah, that's about my introduction, and uh, that's how I'm engaged here in Kaziranga. Yeah. Thank you. And Yannick, would you like to go next? Thank you, Amy, and everyone. My name is Yannick Indoinho, and I'm from Tanzania. I am the executive director of uh, Traditional Ecosystem Survival Tanzania, which is TEST. But I'm uh, at the same time a, a student, uh, a master's student at the University of Oxford studying uh, biodiversity conservation and management. And uh, I am been also a traditional um, elected um, community leader, representing people uh, in the local government but also defending their interests in land and um, rights. And um, basically and briefly, that is my background. And I have been um, working uh, together with other colleagues in Tanzania, defending those rights um, quite aggressively. But I will uh, dwell into much details later on what is actually happening or what is uh, what are the issues at stake right now. Thank you. Okay, and then lastly, Fiore, um, if you'd just like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Fiore Longo. I am a campaigner at Survival International. We are the global movement for tribal peoples, uh, which in concrete means that we are fighting together with indigenous people to defend their lands. Uh, how we are fighting? Well, we are trying to change public opinion here in 
in the so-called uh, Western world, because most of the abuses indigenous peoples are facing uh, have roots here in our own societies. And I am in charge of one of, um, of our campaigns. We have several, but one of them is called Decolonized Conservation. And what we are trying to do is to change the way uh, we, uh, again, in the Western world, are seeing nature and are trying to protect it. Because this way can seem good for us. It can seem actually very in, a very nice thing to do, but it's harming and destroying the lives of the real guardians of the natural world. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to bring everyone, uh, everyone back here. Um, and um, so we've been using this uh, this term fortress conservation kind of in this event. Um, so it'd be great to hear a little bit more from all of you about what this means um, and how you've seen it working. Um, and Fiore, can I start with you um, for this? Yeah, thank you. Fortress conservation sounds actually a little bit technical, uh, but for for uh, if we, we have here people from from countries that from again from the Western world, they would just say that this is the mainstream conservation model. Uh, in Africa and Asia. Well, he, you, here in, in Europe, where, where I am based, uh, we don't have any kind of restrictions to live and to go inside national parks. We can live inside. In UK, the, all, all national parks allow people to live. This is not actually what the conservation model is somewhere else. Um, the model comes from the US. Uh, it, born, uh, it was born in the 19th century um where the first national parks were created and the model is based on the idea that we need to evict all the people living inside a landscape in order to protect it so we, we set aside a piece of nature completely separate from people and uh, this is based on the idea that in order to thrive in order to be in good health nature whatever it would be with it needs to be wild uh so Fortress conservation wouldn't exist without the wilderness idea, the idea that nature is wild. We know today is a myth because science tells us that the, uh, most of the world, including places that we think they are wild, like the Amazon, the Amazon forest or the Congo rainforest or, or Serengeti are not wild at all. They have been shaped by indigenous peoples. But this model of wilderness is a model that tells us it's not true. There is nobody living in these areas and we need to set it aside. But this model is not just a mythology, it's also racist. Because the first national parks in USA has been created by evicting the indigenous people that were living there and saying, indigenous people are primitive, they don't know what they're doing, we need to set aside this land, separate from them. This is the model that was then imported in Africa and Asia during decolonization. And again, it's based on the idea of setting aside the land, telling the primitives that they were called that they can't hunt, they can't uh, feed their families, they can't use their land anymore. But those territories that are set aside as fortress are fortress only for black and local people. Because for the white people that pay to go inside as tourists or as hunters, they're not a fortress. So this, this model of it, it, the name fortress conservation, I always find it a little bit tricky because it's not really a fortress for everyone. It's a fortress according to the color of your skin. And this is the problem with the mainstream model of conservation. That's why I mean, in all countries, we don't have fortress conservation. All of us can enjoy and live inside national parks with some restrictions, but usually with our consent. Somewhere else, we in the Western world, we are pushing and funding a model that is completely different. And for me, I just last thing, it's very important to understand that this fortress conservation model, what is happening in Asia and Africa wouldn't happen without our money. This is where the 90% of the money of the Western countries to protect biodiversity is going to fortress conservation. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Prana, um, what would you have to say about kind of what this means and how you've seen this kind of conservation taking place? Uh, uh, thank you, Ami. And uh, I definitely, would like to agree uh, and uh, second the thoughts that uh, uh, 
Fiore has put uh, put up and uh, the idea that uh, how the fortress conservation is uh, is a product of a colonial mentality is uh, very much evident in places like uh, where since I come from India and it's a, a post-colonial country it's a country that was colonized by the uh, English or the British for more than 200 years uh, basically the reason that I come from as well so here most of the lo laws I mean even today like uh, the laws and legalities the administrative apparatus that uh, governs or that uh, rules uh, the whole idea of a forest or conservation is still embedded from that past era, from the time of the colonial British rules. So where they had a certain outlook towards the reason, towards the land, towards the forest, towards the people. And there we all, we all know that the primary motive was also of uh, profit. Like, uh, it was like, how could we make more profit and at the cost of whom? And it was at the cost of people who were living in these areas. And so this whole construct of a uh, pristine wildness, of a reason that was free of people, of wild, where only animals live, had to be done in a systematic manner. I would like to give a simple example. Like, uh, so indigenous communities have been living in these areas for thousands of years, local indigenous communities who have lived with the biodiversity here. But during the colonial times, I mean, uh, with the advancement of technology and also the use of guns, I mean, there were huge expeditions on hunting, hunting expedition, which were called game. I mean, for a white uh, uh, person, it can be a game, which is like a sport. And for a local, it, it is a crime, like it's hunting. So, I mean, that was there and uh, the whole life, uh, wild animals were killed in huge numbers. It's documented in many, uh, many books and many uh, records during that time. And, uh, and which was one of the primary reasons for the fast, fast depletion in the number of a lot of key species coming to elephants, tigers, rhinoceros, we have so many records of where the colonial administrators were not only governing the space, but they were indulged, engaged in an economic exploitation in trade of like ivory tiger skins, uh, not only uh, hunting for the sake of fun, but also use the, using that as a, the power, as a source of earning revenues by many of these administrators. And that was one of the primary things. And this is what the colonial conservation uh, or the fortress conservation is. Today, it reflects in, all, uh, in, in today's time as well, where you have all those ideas which were put into place at that point of time. And it continues with new colonial outlooks with, uh, with more embedded uh, imperial ideas with more sense of profit, like uh, with uh, the new ideas of like, uh, 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 with making more money out of uh, the ecosystem services or the environment. So these are all that can be framed together to be defined as a fortress form of conservation. Here you have, in order to guard a certain space, like it, unlike Europe, where I guess like since you, uh, since most of the wild habitats there, I, I, I mean, uh, I don't think are uh, restricted the way it is here in this region where like you have laws and legalities where if you come to Kaziranga or which is considered to be a prime example of successful conservation, where there are laws where people can be shot at and there has been records of hundreds of people who have been killed by forest rangers, guards by forest guards armed and that is the fortress model of conservation which is like exclusive for a bureaucracy which is the forest bureaucracy which is exclusive for a section of people like rich tourists who can go in there but not the local indigenous communities who have built that space with their engagement in a dialectical manner with nature for thousands of years yeah i'll come back to it again i guess yeah it's getting long yeah. Thanks, Pranav. Uh, Yannick, um, over to you about um, how you've seen this con kind of model of conservation lay out. 
Oh, hang on a second. You were on mute just then. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Amy. And um, luckily, Barnab and um, Fiore have almost exhausted what this model is all about. Uh, but basically, fortress conservation is purely colonial conservation. Um, we living in Tanzania uh, have gotten to experience um, the realities and the facts of this kind of conservation. And this is how we know, uh, we know it to be colonial. Because after independence, for example, in Tanzania, almost all the laws have been changed. There have been new laws for everything, except for conservation. And uh, this is because conservation, um, which is actually protectionism in, in the way we see it, is being funded uh, by the former colonial uh, masters of, um, of um, the, 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 the developing world, for example. So they've maintained that leadership, they've maintained that um, decision-making uh, benefit to decide how conservation is done. And um, conservation, the way it is, only benefits uh, a few groups of people, tourists, um, hunters, or trophy hunters, which is actually poachers, um, because um, other people hunt for livelihood, hunt animals for livelihood, but they are termed the poachers, and all of them kill animals the same way. But uh, tourist, um, trophy hunters are appreciated and they are congratulated if they hunt and kill wild animals. So conservation, the way it is, is so discriminatory uh, of, um, um, of people and races. So if you are from the, um, the West and the North, uh, you get free access. Um, to, to the lands that have belonged to people um, previously, and they were moved by force. They were removed by force and refused access uh, of, of any kind, access for livelihood or access for culture or access for rituals and tradi and religion. So fortress conservation is purely colonial. Um, the colonial, the, the former colonial masters have continued to fund it. They have continued to decide how it is done. And uh, anything that they want to be conserved, they fund it and they decide. And this is why, like what Fiore was saying, if you go to national parks in Europe, uh, you find no rangers, you find no gun um, militia or military. But if you come to national parks in, in Africa, for example, all the parks are guarded by uh, heavy military personnel. And this, all this is funded by um, the West, but they, they have no such things in their national parks. So uh, it is completely discriminatory. It is um, um, destroying livelihoods of people and cultures and doesn't makes no regard at, at, of any kind at all about rights of people. And now uh, there's another added um, beneficiary of these uh, protected areas or conservation areas. Um, if we get time, we'll speak about it. It is um, how do we minimize the effects of climate change that are happening elsewhere in the world uh, by saying expanding conservation areas in a way of creating uh, what is called carbon credits. So carbon credits, uh, th this is the way of ensuring that uh, production, high consumption, and even um, in, in inducing climate change uh, effects in, in the developed world continue uh, in the effect of um, uh, communities uh, um, and their livelihoods elsewhere in the world. So, so long as they want to continue climate, I mean, um, impacting on climate um, issues, the world will continue to see uh, expansion and the eviction of people, so to create uh, carbon credit things, which is completely um, kind of colonial. I mean, it justifies any, any forceful eviction of people 
for those reasons. So like, uh, like my colleagues, if there will be any question, maybe we'll expand on that. But uh, in reality, for, uh, conservation is still very colonial. Uh, if colonial um, in the past was brutal, cruel, it is still the same today. Thanks very much, Yannick. And yeah, if people have questions on anything that comes up, do put them in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to them in a bit. Um, I wanted to just also ask all of you about um, what uh, what you think should be doing, uh, should be happening to try and tackle these issues with how, uh, with this mainstream approach to conservation um, and where maybe you've seen examples of environmental protection being done particularly well. Um, uh, and yeah, if you have any any thoughts on that, I might go to you first, Yannick, and then to Fiore, and then to Pranab. Oh, Pranab has his hand up though. So uh, did you want to <laughs> jump in? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I just wanted to. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to like add on to what Yannick has been saying, and uh, uh, so uh, so. I mean, uh, what we read about, I have not personally been to Africa, but of what we read about the kind of conservation that is practiced there, the whole, I think, uh, yeah, on the one hand, definitely there's the role of the government, where um, in many countries, maybe the government has a strong position, but in many countries as well, like Kenya, and where we hear about the private uh, reserves, where, uh, which is a model like uh, which is extremely colonial and who are mostly the owners of this private uh, uh, i mean private reserves of uh, wild wild spaces and that is one model like which we are very scared of like it's a new form of uh, colonization of a continent and uh, and these are models which are also being propagated as the successful models which is uh, we are afraid is soon going to become the norm in many other parts of the world like the uh, global south and uh, uh, and uh, sadly like somehow uh, a lot of uh, forest and wildlife still exist in a lot of countries in the global south like the whole uh, like since i come from india and this whole reason that i come from is contiguous uh, to the southeast asian countries and uh, those models, since now recently, like our government in India is also bringing up laws where we are afraid that uh, those are models that will be forcefully enforced here because our uh, laws, which were pro people, like uh, all of you, I mean, uh, uh, some of you must know about the Forest Right Act in India, which was a result of, uh, of a long struggle by forest dwelling communities, indigenous communities, political organizations uh, to recognize the right of uh, people to the forest, of uh, the spaces where they were living. And these are acts which are being uh, in a very, uh, in a very ha haste time. And now these are laws and acts which are being uh, removed and which are being weakened in order to bring in ideas of where uh, you can have like captive plantation. Now trees is the in thing. It's like uh, people globally, like even in a uh, uh, lot of organizations think that if you plant a tree, I mean, the art will become green and uh, uh, the climate change or global warming will go away. It's not like that. And the very definition of forest is very uh, multidimensional and that needs to be understood. It's not only about trees, it's about people surviving, having a good life and uh, having a decent life with basic access to all the basic needs. It's not about uh, having a luxurious life where you have like tourists flying over from different places to watch the trees and the animals, not zoos. So this very concept of colonial conservation is a zoo for people who have not seen animals and we should uh, strongly advocate against it. Yeah, I'm just uh, reflecting after what Yannick was saying. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> Sorry much. For the no, no, it's great. It's great. And then Yannick, I wanted to just come to you uh, to talk a little bit about kind of what what the alternatives are like how things could be done differently or how you've seen things done differently okay thank you very much um i think um the first thing that we should do or it should happen is that um then the global north should stop funding uh conservation projects that 
uh, violate or take land or discriminate against any peoples. I think that is the first thing that we should do because right now, all, all we see is force, violations, um, um, disregard of life. And this is because of the flow of funding and force from the global global north. So for for me, the first thing that we should do is refuse and refrain from funding uh, conservation projects uh, or protection uh, protected areas establishment that violate all these rights. <clears throat> That's one thing we should do. The second thing, uh, for me, uh, what is happening in the world is protectionism. It is not really conservation. Protectionism so that people, uh, certain kind of people are refused uh, access. They are removed, first of all, remove, removed, given very bad names, and then re re refused access so that uh, tourists, hunters, and all these people can have access. So the, the second thing that we should do is allow communities that land is suitable for conservation to be the managers of those places, of those lands, of those areas, because they know better and they have uh, not only um, livelihood interest, but they have values that um, we cannot um, quantify, uh, like religious and rituals. And uh, they have all the reasons to conserve those areas that, um, than even the, um, the government or the people from outside. So the second thing that we should do is allow the communities, indigenous, locals, to be the managers of these uh, conservation areas. Uh, but to remove this colonial attitude and colonial concept, uh, all these areas, if we continue to, to say protected areas, establishment, we continue the same uh, closed conservation where fines, heavy laws are applied. So we should completely redefine what conservation is how we should do, how we should um, make it happen. Because all we see around the world, especially the global south, are conflicts, deprivations, uh, violations, and a lot of complaints that uh, are never addressed. So for me, uh, we should define what what is really conservation and how we want it to, to function in the world so that all these conflicts and uh, violations could, could stop. But also, I think we should address the, the power and the role of corporations. Because right now, the force to establish uh, conservation areas or protected areas is like what I said, to allow more creation of carbon sinks so that uh, it can give certain kind of leave for the uh, high productions and conservation uh, co consumption, um, which is enforced by the corporations. I think we should address and reduce the power of uh, influence of corporations uh, in land management, in conservation and um, uh, and rights of, of other people. So for me, briefly, those are the things that I, I think they should happen immediately so that we, uh, we see and reverse uh, the current trend of uh, violations in conservation. Thanks, Yannick. Um, over to you for Fiore. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I think I, it might be like a, my, I might sound like a party pooper, but I think that we should stop thinking that we are going to find a universal solution, a super catchy marketing slogan that is going to solve all our problems without us in the global north having to give up anything of the way we live. So I have heard so many of these ideas, nature-based solutions, climate solutions, let plant some trees somewhere, let turn the 30% of the world in a protected area, let us stop all of us eating meat and start eating base, plant-based, whatever. All these ideas that coming from the global north as great solutions that, doesn't, that don't involve really changing the way we produce, we consume, the way we live, which is called capitalism, are not going to take anywhere. Instead of going to Africa and Asia and telling Africans and Asia how they should be protecting their forests, 
We should shut up. We have been doing this for centuries and we clearly don't know what we are doing. We are actually ruining people's lives. The problem is not there. The problem is here. If there are forests at the, down there, there are wild animals and there are not wild animals and forests here, there must be a reason. And it's so obvious. And, and the thing that makes me sometimes quite angry is that not just obvious from as a, as a person doing field work, so I go there and I can see that, it's also obvious from a scientific perspective. If we look at the data that we have today, we know for sure, this is scientific data, that indigenous territories, so those places where indigenous people have their lands right recognized, manage to protect more biodiversity and have less deforestation than protected areas. We know for sure scientific data that protected areas, the majority of protected areas, haven't achieved the protection of wildlife animals in the places where they have been created. We know this, we have data. We know all of this. We have that. We know for sure that the drivers of biodiversity lost are not indigenous people hunting or, or uh, for food or practicing pastoralism because it's their way of life. We know that the drivers of biodiversity law are the way they have the habitat loss induced by industrialization, the overconsumption led by the global north, the use of pesticide, climate change, and I can go on and on and on. So we know where the roots of the problems are. Instead, we decide on purpose to look somewhere else and then go there and propose this magic formula created by some, some I don't know, marketing team in, in, in Washington, D.C., to solve the problems of the world. So I think that that's why decolonized conservation is so important. We have to acknowledge that there are people around in the world out there that they have known and they know how to do this better than us. That the problem is not for them, it's our problem. So why we don't start doing conservation to ourselves and start looking at ourselves and what we are doing wrong? All of the other things are distractions. These slogans that are being shouted out, especially in the Guardian columns, by the way, are just slogans. They're not going to solve the problem. Turning the world into the 30%, this is what they are not just a slogan. This is what is going to be decided if we don't stop it at the COP15, now happening in, in one week in December, the most important com uh, meeting on, the co on biodiversity happening now is proposing to turn the 30% of the world into protected area. Then what happened in the other 17, who cares? These proposals are not pushed by anyone. These are proposals are pushed by Western organizations that are uh, human rights violators, like WWF, WCS, African Park, but also big corporations. Of course, for Shell and Total and Nestlé, it's a great idea to go around there in Africa and just create a national park without actually reducing their emissions. So I think that we should, this is the most important thing, look at the root of the problem. They're not going to be one solution that is available for everyone. There will be several solutions, but we need to give the solutions exist already. I have seen that in indigenous people taking care of their land. I have seen here in Europe with among a lot of pe people having political ideas about how to change the way we produce and you consume. But we have to give them space instead of, you know, trying to embrace in desperation the last solution that has been done by a marketing, uh, yeah, marketing a corporate um, team of people working. Yeah. Thank you so much, Viore. Um, and Pranab, just um, if you have anything brief to add on this question of like how we can do things differently, and we've got lots of questions from the audience. So uh, yeah, if you could keep it brief, that'd be great. I mean, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very complex uh, question for sure. But, uh, but the biggest irony is like when uh, uh, convention of parties like the COP and events like that, which are supposed to be the events that uh, uphold the rights of people or the uh, rights of nature are funded by corporations like Coca-Cola. I mean, uh, companies which have taken away the most basic uh, need and the most basic needs uh, for people to survive water, like uh, bottled water and all these things. And these are companies who claim to whole conventions and who claim to fund so what is actually what is it that we can expect from events like that are there enough uh, voices that come from the actual understanding are there enough uh, scientific voices who speak the truth i mean so it's very uh, blurred and these are the times which uh, makes people more insecure people communities across the globe and if i come to 
contextualize in terms of like how it plays out in places like uh, where i come from like where since i come from kaziranga national park area and tiger reserve which is considered to be one of the successful models of conservation and what is the cost that this uh, uh, conservation model at what cost has it come it has come with the uh, with hundreds and thousands of people being displaced with the uh, local communities being vilified and projected as uh, anti animals anti forest and uh, they are being uh, there are being laws that are being implemented there in order to shoot and kill them and these are the things that needs to be spoken about like how do we decentralize this brute force and make uh, communities concern a central question in the whole argument or in the whole framing of policies now there are so much money that's coming in from global north but how, is it being accountable to all the human right violations that are taking place i mean there are one or two commissions that come up once in a while i mean it's just a band aid kind of a solution without any real Im uh, impact on the ground and we are seeing it's deteriorating and we are scared like in this neo fascist uh, global environment authoritarian environment these are things to be worried about and how do we tackle with it is like uh, definitely the like, uh, the advanced countries and the west has to play an important role and it needs to come from radical people's movement where people come together to raise these questions and actually bring the struggle to the streets to the hands of the people where they can challenge all these authorities there are many i mean we are hopeful because there are so many uh, inspiring uh, events that's taking place across the globe and this needs to come together it needs to be a collective voice against the tyranny that's being implemented on us Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to move to some questions now. Thanks, Yannick. I can see you've already started answering them in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, so the first question um, that I wanted to ask, I'm going to maybe just divide them up a bit because there's quite a few to get through. So um, this one, I was going to go to Fiore about this because um, I have a vague memory of you mentioning this when we spoke previously. Um, so it's a question from uh, Jamie. Uh, did the panel have any thoughts or critiques on the rewilding movement? Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah. Uh, well, um, I, I, I always find funny what rewilding means. So, uh, so we, we decided a geological era, and then we tried to come back to that. It's like, who is deciding uh, for how long we have to go behind, like how many years we have to go back? in time uh, to rewild. Uh, so until, and, 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 and for me, the key is who is deciding is key. And this is not just a, a thing, and it's important to say that it's happening to indigenous people. This is also happening in Europe. Uh, in UK, there is a big movement of rewilding, and there is also happening in France. So lands that are, uh, so someone, uh, usually people in the city decides, that's how it works in France at least, that some kind of land has to be rewilded whatever that means. And then they start this process without considering that there are people living there and that they have been living in that land for generations. And I think that this, um, this idea of someone, especially living in the city without any contact with nature, deciding when the nature was wild enough for them <laughs> and then trying to implement this in a, in a kind of, of very social engineeristic way, it's very scary. Um, I'm not saying that there are no... Uh, forests that need to be restored. And that, of course, it can be done with local population, and then they will tell you. I find very problematic that now it became, again, a tag to any project that someone create in their, in their, in their uh, desk in Brussels or in Washington, saying how a place should look like according to them. In some going back into time without, oh, how long? It's like we want to rewind as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. There's no science behind it. And it's very dangerous. Uh, this is one of the things. Uh, and, and again, the idea of wilderness, it's not scientific based. We know today that most of the places, except the poles, have been shaped by human beings. Um, so that is, is, it's another thing. 
uh, and I also feel there is a little bit of danger in the rewilding when it's linked to carbon credits. So the idea that we can keep uh, destroying the world, but then rewilding some places, and then this will produce carbon credit to be sold in the market so Shell can continue destroying the planet and then buy this carbon credit is also dangerous. So I think that I wouldn't say that we are uh, just, you know, uh, as conservation, um, like completely speaking out, because not all the rewilding projects are the same. Uh, but uh, according to what you mean with rewilding, you know, you are talking about rewilding, restoring, but we need to be very careful. People should be looking very well who is deciding what they're going to do with the land of whom. Because what is here at the stake is the land. Who is the land? Who, the, who is the land and whose are the solutions? Because if you shell wanting rewilding, but the, the land is not of, of Shell, <laughs> the land is of someone else. So we have to be very careful what rewilding means and where are the scientific bases to support this. And I don't think that question is very, is very well, uh, is very well uh, inquired by, by people supporting rewilding. Okay, thanks, Fiore. Um, uh, I wanted to ask this question from Vanessa, and I don't know anyone, any of one from the panel who wants to answer this. Um, how does this issue connect with climate finance under, for example, the COP process? Should it be managed? Who should benefit? Is global, is global fund to government doomed to failure? Is, is the global fund direct to indigenous communities potentially divisive and corrupting? Um, do any of you have any thoughts you want to share on this? Um, I have thought that I don't know if, if Yannick or Pranav have yeah. something. I go ahead first. Um, if I have to respond very briefly, um, this question of um, decisions being made in COP uh, and the other COP, because there are several COPs, uh, without um, deeper knowledge and information of uh, the victims, especially the communities, uh, have no really meaning or impact eventually uh, to, to the communities or to nature. So uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, the decisions that are being made in, in these scopes are either two. One is expanding conservation of protected areas and increasing the finance that is going to communities or to wherever. But uh, I mean, more money uh, in the same, or without changing the attitudes, without changing the um, uh, our aims, or without changing anything that has been uh, the norm, won't help. So for me, one thing uh, is for governments that are going to cope to put a, a stop to the influence of corporations and capitalism, because uh, it, it won't help communities eventually if capitalism continues to have a lot of grip and uh, power in land and conservation management. That's one. But um, still, a lot of money is needed uh, in conservation. And uh, government, uh, without changing the laws, even if you send more money to communities, which is okay, I, I actually support, but there's a lot of laws and a lot of regulations that have been have to be changed so that uh, communities can actually benefit uh, in this uh, financial resources and financial decisions that are made, being made in COPS. So uh, gov unfortunately, governments have only one way of doing this, and it is uh, succumbing to the pressure of increasing uh, the size, the areas of protected areas, and uh, is taking more land from communities. So I would say uh, a mechanism to change the laws, a mechanism to change the influence of capitalism, but to empower more communities and giving more financial resources to communities is probably going to help. Thanks, Yannick. Um, did either of you want to add anything before we move on to another question? I uh, I guess uh, I'll just uh, have a brief uh, uh, addition to what uh, Yannick and uh, Fiore have uh, mentioned, and uh, I I think like uh, 
i think like uh, the genesis of a lot of our problems is also this whole idea of finance and the capital understood or which is the dominant form of capitalism that's there in the world and so it's a uh, it's i mean yeah it's a uh, it's a tricky proposition to uh, to communities to nations and uh, uh, since all this doesn't come without without a baggage Uh, so finance has never been like uh, uh, without a hidden agenda, and uh, even here the finance that is coming up, and uh, how we see now since uh, a certain country's laws and legalities or certain things and how it will be uh, implemented, who will hold these finances, who will have the power to decide, and communities like who. indigenous or local communities who might have a different understanding of value and how will they i mean even if you give them money how will they be able to articulate this whole idea of finance capital and how they would use it i mean it's uh, something to be pondered and thought about and uh, the accountability like uh, how do we bridge the gap of accountability between the donors like people sitting in a uh, the headquarters of maybe switzerland or usa or the global north and the recipients like uh, or the most people for whom they are not the recipients the subjects on whom it is being uh, it is being claimed to be invested like how do we keep the check and balance that gap needs to be drastically like shortened it needs to like i said before like every penny needs to be accountable and it needs to see to the matter of fact that it's not disposing someone from their homes it's not uh, killing someone uh, with arms that are being procured by that finance and how do we make this accountable and that is what i am concerned about and uh, for that i think we need a radical shift in the idea of uh, conservation or uh, the idea of uh, climate change and how to how to address it needs to change i mean the systemic change that we talk about like uh, in this age when there is so much alienation and the process of money i mean cash money is uh, it's uh, the way it has penetrated and uh, corrupted systems and uh, spaces needs to be radically changed or else just uh, pumping in money for the sake of planting trees or for the sake of building wildlife parks would not help this only will make us more dispensable like the bottom 80% of the people in this world are being made dispensable and we have to worry about this maltesian idea where like a majority of the people in this world can be just uh, i mean annihilated for the sake of a few people and this needs to be changed yeah thanks pranav um i'm going to move on just because there's been quite a few questions about how things can be done better and where you've seen seen examples of things being done better so uh, raymond is saying can we have more positive ideas about how we can serve our environment while getting the support of indigenous people and paul is asking are there currently any examples in india or africa or elsewhere of where conservation in national parks is being done correctly uh and then also romi uh, said how can we fix it we can't expect that this problem is going to get solved in a few days how could we do that um fiore if you wanted to go first and then maybe i'll see if yana can prana yana can uh, prana have things to add uh, i just wanted to clarify that a national park so it's a very specific category of protected area there are different kind of protected areas national park is one of the more uh, where there are more restrictions um the categories are the IUCN category the international union for uh, nature conservation of course conservation you know, nature and uh, this is the the one the category that applies especially in certain parts of the world in africa we know that the majority of the protected areas are the most restrictive types so when you ask the question um are all the national parks bad well it depends where they are made <laughs> Uh, usually in africa and asia national parks are very restrictive and that means that human beings that were practicing whatever they were doing before that they can't do it anymore 
most of the places, as I explained, they, they have been inhabited before. And so the creation of national power has been made, especially during colonial time, but not only, we have the, more, the biggest acceleration of the creation of protected areas in Africa has been in the 80s and the 90s, and not by chance, I will explain later. Um, this part has been created, the majority of them, I don't have any example that has been done with the consent of the people, because who can give the consent to lose their land and what they are for protecting tigers or elephants or whatever they are there? knowing that they are not destroying them. I don't know any people that would say, yes, take everything we have so we can save elephants. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. For the people I have been working with, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, why, why white people are, are sending us away of our own land? Why they don't take the elephants and, and take them into Europe? That's why the, the indigenous peoples of Congo have been telling me for a long time. So no, I, I don't think there are national parks that are good in Africa and Asia. They have been done in this way. I don't have any other, no, any other example. They are very restrictive and they don't allow people to be doing what they have been doing for so long and that actually is working because if they want to create a national park there, it's because people have been taking care of it and there is biodiversity. And, and among the solutions, I think that I said it before, giving land rights to indigenous people is one of the solutions. I don't believe there is one solution. One of the solutions is look at the data. We know it, 80% of biodiversity is on their land. And this is not by magic or God that create the plants and the trees where indigenous people live. It's because they actually do things. They interact with the environment in a way that is good for the environment. And we have to stop thinking about these human beings as, I don't know, it's primitive, which is what actually, these people know what they are doing. It's enough to spend one day with the Maasai in Tanzania, and you will learn more about the entire thing that we call nature, that in any scientific book and that any documentary of Netflix that we are used to watch, they know what they are doing. They're, nevertheless, they are being treated as they are overgrazing. And then there are these experts from NGOs that sit down in, as I repeat, in Brussels, in Frankfurt, and they go to tell the Maasai how they have to graze because the Maasai haven't figured out in all these years. So I think this is the problem. The solution is there. Give the Maasai their land instead of keeping stealing it. It's, it's there the solution, we know it. Where the Maasai are, they are more in Gorongoro conservation area. It's the place of the world with the highest density on, uh, about, on, on wildlife and lions in Africa. And the Maasai are living there. And then now they want to evict them to protect nature. It's not true. They don't want to evict the people to protect nature. They want to evict people to create lodge for, for, for rich people. And this is part of the, like, where are the solutions? Where stop? believing in the mythology of conservation. Let's start destroying our myth and then start supporting indigenous people. And we don't need, and linking to the, the finance thing, we don't need, okay, I wouldn't say that there are different, different things. One thing is a public money. Another thing is climate finance or financial market. We don't need market-based solutions to solve the, cli the climate problems or the environmental problems. We are here because of market solutions. This is, we are here today with climate change accelerating with biodiversity loss because we let market to lead, our ex to, to lead our existence. What we should be doing, several things. Again, support indigenous people and stop believing in fake solutions. This is for me the most important thing. The moment we stop believing in this, we can really create a movement and, and try to change the situation. Thanks. Um, Yannick or Pranab, do you have anything you want to say on this? Because I know it's something that a few people were asking about. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, for me, uh, what I would say is right now, the world is at 17% uh, protected. That's what they say. It's not solving uh, our problems with at least regards with climate change. And this is why they want to protect um, up to 30% of the world. What I would say is conservation or whatever they call it, is not working. It is, uh, it is purely um, based or rooted in uh, colonial uh, rules and mentality, and we have to dismantle it. We have to dismantle that way of conservation because it is not helping the world. After, th after 2030, they will probably come up with another idea of increasing um, uh, 2040. Um, another 
40% of the world that has to be protected. It means the world, uh, the way the world is being conserved or protected is not helping the world um, at all. So for me, we have to dismantle this uh, conservation attitude because like you are, when you asked about examples, there are no examples of national parks that are working. All of them um, um, are rooted and based on the fortress conservation, fines and fences, and brutality and milita militarism. The, none of them is working. This is how they have been established. So we have to dismantle that system and allow me more people, especially indigenous and local communities, to be at the center of uh, advising and leading the world in conservation. If we don't do that, we will always be at this uh, the same uh, similar discussion, um, complaining about uh, the consequences of this kind of conservation uh, because it is not working. For like what Fiora is saying, we will always be design, designing um, um, projects like climate uh, finance, uh, market-based solutions, and this and that. Uh, because we refuse to look into the real problem. And the real problem is this kind of conservation, which we are uh, advocating in, uh, globally, has completely failed to produce any sustainable outcomes that we really require. So we have to dismantle it and restructure it. Thanks, Yannick. Um, Pranab, um, do you have anything very, very quick you want to say on this question? <laughs> um, and then I have a couple more things uh, to add and we'll have to start wrapping up soon. I think, yeah, this very uh, synthetic model of uh, conservation or the solutions to the climate change, which is being propagated by uh, powerful lobbies whose interest is like the growth or development, which is uh, in the normative sense, uh, needs to continue. And at the same time, uh, there needs to be like uh, more green. So it's a very flawed idea in its very genesis. And uh, so whatever little, I mean, uh, spaces we had uh, is getting more regimented. It's getting more controlled. And it's a very wrong direction that we are going in. And at least in spaces like uh, uh, the Global South or countries like where we come from, we see that uh, it's an uh, uh, upscaling or ascending order of people getting uh, uh, dispossessed of their rights. So the model is fundamentally flawed somewhere. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, greed for growth where like you will have uh, more development, more cars, more big cities, more buildings and uh, more luxury and everything. And uh, also at the same time, the idea that you will be able uh, more, I mean, uh, carbon fuel as in uh, like uh, petroleum or, and that at the same, even the solutions which they are saying green are, are uh, problematic in a lot of ways. I mean, so it, it is about, I guess, the idea should be of where like uh, the resources should be democratized, where uh, people uh, need to scale down at a uh, global level. Uh, I don't mean to say that scaling down in the sense of uh, where we are getting poor as uh, or getting our lives are getting harder, but we know that uh, the difference in uh, uh, the economy of the lowest section of the people in the world and if a very small elite section is so huge that it, it 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 just doesn't make any sense. So we have to think at that level. I know it's uh, too big a task to be asked, and uh, by and coming from small spaces like ours, but this is what we need to understand, I guess. Thank you. Um, and before we end the questions, I just had a um, question which I was going to put to either you, Yannick, or you, Pranab. Um, so um, Ibrahim is asking, how can you overcome speaking in the name of indigenous people? Can our academic knowledge translate their problems into solutions? Um, do you have anything brief either of you want to say on that? And then I think we need to uh, stop the questions. Uh, uh, yeah, Nick, you want to go ahead? I did not understand that question clearly. Uh, how can we stop uh, speaking? in the name of indigenous people, is that the question? Yeah. Um, 
Well, some of us are indigenous peoples. It's very difficult to uh, disassociate ourselves with the term or the name. And uh, it is true that academicians, for example, have a, a big role to play in defining and guiding the decision-making processes in the world. In fact, it is them uh, who do research uh, about issues, conservation, indigenous people's rights, and all this. And uh, well, we cannot uh, dissociate ourselves with the uh, with the term and uh, and indigenous peoples generally. I think academics have a big role to play in that. In how do we bring up solutions that help people? Uh, how do we really um, look back and uh, assess how we did research uh, in the past? And how can we use the same skills in research to, to design and develop solutions for, uh, for people and nature and the world? Thank you. Uh, Proud, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? I, I mean, it's a uh, question which is, uh, uh, I think it's a very ethically and a value-laden uh, question. And uh, uh, definitely even in academia or in terms of like uh, organizations or um, associations, how they function on this question. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know if there is an universal answer to it, but uh, definitely how do you be more accountable to the voices that you speak about is something which needs to be progressively thought about. And uh, amplifying indigenous voices and uh, where indigenous uh, representatives or local community representatives, how uh, those voices are amplified to the maximum is the task of everyone uh, who might have the possibility and um, uh, and uh, and the space uh, to accommodate that should uh, take it take that as a, a responsibility and um, and that's how we can build on solidarity and that's how we can diversify the voice as well or else like uh, I mean definitely if an extractive form of uh, academia or an organizational a top-down approach of uh, organizational working apparatus has not uh, has not uh, found us any solutions we know that uh, from the history of uh, uh, knowledge production or uh, even organizations working so this needs to be changed to a more uh, uh, collaborative and a democratic process. Thanks so much, Pranab. And before we go, I just wanted to go to our speakers to um, to ask them if there's one thing that they think we could all be doing after this event to address the issues that we've talked about. And Pranab, um, anything from you on that front? Uh, uh, I as in uh, like uh, there's so much uh, that's happening it's very overwhelming the kind mm. of um, pressure the changes the change in polity economy and uh, i mean uh, uh, we are afraid like our uh, democratic constitutions are getting dismantled and uh, in this time of increasing uh, depletion of democracies i guess uh, we have to uh, write more speak more get together more and uh, try to keep the universal uh, at least uh, values and ethics like which uphold uh, a better world for all of us uh, to prevail and uh, and i mean there's definitely no one answer and i'm too overwhelmed with everything that's happening around and uh, and the kind of pressure that we go through like i come from india i have so many uh, false cases against me just for uh, voicing out our concerns like uh, of what we do like when we fight for the people's right we are we don't even have the right to protest to speak like which should be a fundamental right for people and so these are very worrying times and uh, these are i mean everyone in their locations can amplify this and maybe uh I don't know how the solution will come, but uh, these are our concerns. Yeah. Thank you. And Yannick, do you have anything you want to be you want to ask people to do after this event? Um, one thing is we need um, a lot of united voice 
um, because exactly what Pranab just said is um, same everywhere. Uh, myself and the other few colleagues of mine just returned from exile uh, following this land conflict. Um, so a lot of voice and uh, events like this one to educate, to create more awareness in the North of what is really happening in the global South, the refer conservation and, 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 and this. So that we have actually, because conservation and land management are very undemocratic uh, issues in the developed world, in developing world. You speak about those, uh, you get yourself um, a ticket for arrest and detention and all these other bad things. So you could help us a lot if you organize issues like this, create more awareness, write more about this in the North, like what Fior and uh, Survival International are doing in, in their campaigns. And uh, because what you do up there have direct impact on what's happening down here. So uh, for us, we would like to be able to defend and speak about our rights and interests uh, very freely, openly, uh, democratically, which, but we can't because of the restrictions that uh, Pranab just said, and they apply everywhere. But we trust that the more voice you raise up there, probably a lot of change would happen down here. Thank you, Yannick. And Fiore, um, before we go, is there anything you want to ask people to be doing? Yeah, <laughs> well, there are a lot of things that I think people should be doing. So first of all, um, I, I invite everyone to share and, 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 and actually send the email uh, to their negotiators, the negotiators representing their country during the CBD negotiations, uh, to tell them that you think 30% is not a good idea and it's going to violate indigenous rights. If this thing pass, a lot of more funding will be available for conservation organizations like WWF or WCS to create more parks on the lands of indigenous peoples. The other thing, it's very important, as Yannick was saying, uh, the awareness and the public, um, the public awareness about this. There are many cases currently in which indigenous people are, are losing their lives in the name of conservation. I just want to mention Kausi Viega, where minority rights group, for example, a UK-based organization has been working on, where terrible abuses have been happening, uh, including mass rapes and two um, kids that had been burned by uh, park rangers. This with the support of WCS and, 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 and German funding. Loliondo, now the Maasai are being evicted, and, and there is a lot of violence going on, a lot of repression from the government, also kind of uh, harassment, another kind of violence of uh, the Maasai in uh, Ngorongoro conservation area. All these violence are funded or are supported, when it's not direct money, sometimes just support, by our government. So write to your MPs, write to your government, and ask them to stop abuses in the name of conservation. This is public money. This money goes all directly to national parks, or it goes to projects around the national parks, or it goes to conservation organizations that are doing the wrong job. So inform yourself. We have several things on our page, but there's all, a lot of things in the internet too. And, and write to your MPs, write to your government, and ask them to stop the abuses. Uh, the European Parliament, for example, is doing nothing against the abuses on the Maasai, while, while a lot of funding from the EU is going to Tanzania. These are just examples. There is a lot of going on with this money that comes from us, but we have a lot of power. We can do the things. It's not that this money comes from someone else. Yes, of course, there is the Tanzanian government that is horrible. There is the Congolese government that is horrible. But they are being horrible with our money. <laughs> so it's also our responsibility. And I think that this is very important that you keep informing yourself. Survival is publishing actions um, all the time. So uh, keep engaged also in our social media but also have a look, inform yourself. And, and, and we, we have a very uh, difficult time getting all uh, this, this campaign is, and this case is on the main press because conservation, criticizing conservation is taboo. Uh, so um, just keep, keep informing yourself because there are things that you can do and, and, and we share it uh, more, more or less all the time, not only after hundreds of very good activists out there and, and great organization there are and, and of course great uh, indigenous uh, people uh, in, that you can you can follow and you can listen and, and that they need the support. 
Thanks, Fiore. Um, I'm just going to add, keep reading New Internationalist, <laughs> of course. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everyone who's joined us, to Fiore, Yannick and Pranab as well for all your really important insights. Um, it would be really useful to us if people could um, fill in the short survey, which uh, Husna has shared in the chat, um, to help us improve how we run events like this. Um, and you can also find out more about New Internationalists at our website, um, and you can sign up to our mailing list, find out about more events like this, um, and or perhaps sign up for a subscription, uh, which we really rely upon as our kind of one of our main sources of income for the magazine. Um, and yeah, just to say thank you again for coming and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Um, and we'll leave the chat open for another minute or so just in cases, because I know there's been a lot of links shared um, in case you just want a few minutes to take those, a few seconds to take those down. Um, but thank you very much and see you all again soon.